Jim Mulvihill here with a special Breeders' Cup edition of the How to Bet Horse Racing podcast on video today. And your normal host, Ed DeRosa, is actually going to be the guest. So uh, Ed's got some strong opinions on the Breeders' Cup, and we want to get right to them. Now, Ed, uh, you and I, we take in a lot of data every day in our jobs, and the Breeders' Cup can be a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So on your, first, on your first pass through these two days of past performances, what really stood out to you? Uh, well, I, I like to look at two numbers, Jim. Uh, the first is the class rating because we actually have class ratings for a lot of the international runners. So really beneficial to see how the class over there stacks up to the class here. Now, obviously, the ARC is a better race than most of our turf races, but some of these come from group two and group three races and the good ones match up really well with ours or better and sometimes horses who get a little bit of a reputation don't match up as well and that's an opportunity to bet against so class rating something i look at and then prime power uh, is definitely a must-have especially for the dirt races and the thing that struck me is competitive racing this year but not a ton of standouts on dirt now obviously we have midnight bizu in omaha beach who we'll get to but even a race like the sprint who has some obvious superstars very competitive group same with the philly and mm -hmm. mare sprint kofefi and come dancing so handicappers i think are going to have to make some hard decisions about where to lean because one thing you definitely don't want to do in these full fields is use the top two choices in every race you'll go broke right well i, I do want to hear more about some of the specific horses that you like uh, the post draw on Monday, one of the big storylines was who had drawn the rail. That includes uh, the favorites in both of the juvenile dirt races, Kofefe, who you mentioned. Uh, how do you think these, these rail draws impact these races? I think uh, on balance, most trainers would prefer not the rail, not because you can't win from there, but any indiscretions, mistakes that happen are exasperated from the rail. So if you're a front running type and you miss the break, you're out of your element right away. Now, if you break on top and cruise, like maybe a Kofefe they decide to do, great, the rail can actually help. But the margin for error, I think, is elongated from the rail. Not necessarily sure. a negative, but if it is a negative, it's more of a negative from the rail. Juvenile race is not as big a deal. I think the two-year-olds separate themselves a little more. You get that sort of stretching impact because some two-year-olds are so clearly better than others. And I do think that's the case with Dennis's moment. I think he's one of the more likely winners on the weekend. And the rail did nothing to make me think otherwise. Uh, just with two-year-olds, he's going to be in the first flight no matter what happens. So unless things go really wrong, as it did in his debut when he threw the jockey, uh, I don't see that as a negative. So certainly some positives. I think more, more than anything, it's overwrought, though. I hope people do bet against the rail uh, because I don't think it's that big of an issue. All that said, Catalina Cruiser and Kofefi, I'd say, are the two who have the most to lose just because in a sprint, there's less time to, to make up and be tactical. So those are the two hurt the most, but even for them, it's not as big an issue for me. Right, I agree with that. Uh, listening to you break down the classic with Joe Christofek a few minutes ago, it was very uh, apparent that you're against some of the biggest names on the card. Um, Omaha Beach, McKinsey, Midnight Bizu. Uh, those are the superstars. So tell us why you're against uh, the biggest stars on the Breeders' Cup days. Well, I'll start with Omaha Beach because this horse's reputation is as if he split the atom. And while <laughs> certainly I respect that he's won multiple grade one races, he's one of the few three-year-old males this year to do so. I cannot play him at a short price in a grade one race, second off a layoff after, num after the number he put up in the breeders, excuse me, in the, uh, the six furlong race, the sprint championship. Too fast, too soon. Richard Mandela is one of the best ever, but at a short price, I just have too many questions that A, can he replicate that effort? B, how does the two-turn mile suit what he wants to do? He was going to be the favorite in the Kentucky Derby. He just happened to be fast enough in the Breeders' Cup, excuse me, in the Sprint Championship at Santa Anita. The dirt mile is a totally different ball game. I have too many questions at a short price, Jim. And the field isn't all that deep, admittedly. I do think they picked the softest spot of the three they were leaning to. That just means he's going to be the shortest price of the three spots as well. So I'm against a lot of hype for a for a horse that Way won by a nose hype. last time. Yeah, exactly. And Chancelot's one of the horses to beat in the sprint, but yeah, it's just too much hype. Um, so tell me what you do with these horses when you when you're against a heavy favorite on a day like the Breeders' Cup, that's an opportunity to win a lot of money. So what's the best so. way to go about it? 
Well, for me, uh, especially looking ahead to the classic where I'm against McKinsey, the race before is the turf, and I do like bricks and mortar. Uh, he's a horse who, after that Pegasus Turf Cup, I thought he could be any kind, and then I guess he lost some luster because he only beat a horse by a nose at fairgrounds. But as far as I'm concerned, you rattle off the grade one races he has this year. You deserve yep. to be the favorite in the turf, and he is. Uh, but he's a favorite I'm not trying to beat. So uh, I'm going to lean on him and try to go as deep as I can in the classic. Uh, and same with uh, the race before, uh, which is the distaff, who I'm against Midnight Bizu. So I'm against two favorites, and I'm going to use my single and then – it doesn't matter who wins the other two as long as it's not the favorite. Omaha Beach is a little different earlier on the card, uh, but Sister Charlie is a horse I am very much for. Uh, yeah. So she's one I'm going to lean on. And we've seen the Dirt Mile produce some big, big numbers now. Granted, horses like Golden Sense and Liam's Map have won at short prices, but Dakota Phone won at a big price at Churchill. Uh, so it has produced some prices. And if you beat Omaha Beach, who knows? Now, all year long, you've been talking about Sister Charlie. Tell us a little bit more about why she's one of the favorites that you actually are bullish on. Yeah, and I, I wish Magical were still in the race because she could have added some price to Sister Charlie. I think we could have got two to one. Now we're looking at even money at best, maybe even odds on. So it, it's pretty uh, important to me to find some prices around her. So beating a horse like Omaha Beach would help. Uh, but I do think she's the most likely winner of any Breeders' Cup race. She's just one of those, I I'm not a big replay guy, or I know what I'm looking at when I'm looking at a horse. I leave that to the experts. But I do think I've seen enough races, Jim. I know the extremes. Know when something looks really bad, know when something looks really good. And when I was there on Million Day when she won the Beverly D, she looked as good as a horse could possibly look. Right. Granted, she was the best horse in the race, but she took it to another level in my mind. And I think she's special. And I go back to how I handicapped the Diana earlier this year when she faced Rushing Fall, faced a few others. My handicapping thought was, if I'm going to pick this horse to be Enable or Winks, I'm going to pick her to win an American race. And there's no Enable or Winks here in the Breeders' Cup. I'm sticking with her. Well, there you have some very strong opinions to work with. Um, now we just have to figure out how to make money with them. Some final thoughts on managing your bankroll over these two days and how to make the most out of these strong opinions. I think Breeders' Cup Day is a day where whatever your strong opinions are, whether it's for a horse or against a horse, and we've talked about both ends of the spectrum here, uh, that's where you need to put most of your capital. So if there happens to be a sequence where you don't have any of those opinions, it's okay to lay off. The money is so good when you connect at Breeders' Cup that you don't want to not be able to use an eighth or ninth choice with a sister Charlie that you give any sort of chance to because, oh, I played the pick three yesterday in turf races I knew nothing about, you know, two-year-olds coming over from Europe. So to me, it's all about being judicious and making sure if your opinion comes in uh, that you cash. Well, Ed, thanks for these opinions. Thanks to you for dropping in on the How to Bet Horse Racing podcast, and good luck at Santa Anita.